Okay. All right. I love that graphic, by the way. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. Beautiful. My friend made it. Yeah. Lisa Reagan. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, my talk is going to be very broad and just sort of give you glimpses of the issues that I'm trying to integrate because I uh, can't go into a lot of detail on any of them. But uh, so please ask mm -hmm. questions later. Keep a list of your questions because I'll probably say something that sticks you uh, sticks my my finger in your eye. <laughs> I hope <laughs> not, but <laughs> um, but um, and I can be kind of blunt, so <laughs> I hope I'm... we can appreciate that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's age, you know, <laughs> loses the tongue. <laughs> All right, so uh, here we go. EvolveNest.org is our website, so there's more there. That's for the public mostly. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. You're gonna let me go. So uh, these are the overview of the pathway here through the talk, talk about the current situations, how we got here, what a nested childhood looks like, and the effects of unnested childhoods. Mm. So just as to review quickly what's happening to people, and this is focusing in on the USA, which tends to export its ways to the world. We've got human ill being spreading, and this is even before COVID and the economic downturn, all this stuff was happening already. So increased mental illness and violence, drug addiction, suicide, shrinking lifespan in the last few years, although this past year, I guess it, it didn't shrink. Uh, and then folks under age 55 are at a health disadvantage compared to other advanced nations. And that's important for other no nations to know because we export our ways, our med medical technologies to others and opinions about how children should be raised. And child well-being is usually at the bottom, near the bottom of advanced nations. And we have in our college students, empathy decreasing, narcissism increasing, along with insecure attachment. So these are all signals to me that something's not right. And then we have at the same time, the planet. We have reached the four horsemen of the environmental apocalypse. So this is a massive toxification of, of every, everything, essentially, including food chains, degradation of the atmosphere, including ozone depletion, global warming. We're hitting almost the hothouse earth where uh, weather patterns will be so un, unstable and unpredictable. And then the death of birth, which is the extinction of millions of species. So we're here. They've been predicting it for decades some for at least a century, and now we are here. Why? How did we get here? How did we become so unsustainable in the way we live our lives? This is Noam Chomsky's statement I really like, the grim prognosis for life on the planet is the consequence of a few centuries of forgetting what traditional societies knew and that the surviving ones still recognize. This must be one of our highest values or we are all doomed to remember what our ancestors, even in Europe, just a few hundred years ago, knew. Mm. I'm gonna focus in on <clears throat> the kind of in general, the indigenous perspective, which is a little older than that, but just remember this, this is not the way it needs to be for any of us. So what, how do we get here, the pathway? What have we forgotten? What do sustainable indigenous societies have to teach the modern world? First, we belong to the earth. Uh, you know, instead of the earth belonging to us, right? We belong to the earth. The earth doesn't need us. We need it to function well. And part of this then indigenous worldview is to understand and to sense with all senses that nature is alive. All is sentient. Nature is a partner and we need to live well in harmony with cyclical nature, the seasons, things come and go, life, uh, something is born, lives and then dies and transformed into another life form. That's just the way the world works. And we understood that before civilization, before Sumer civilization started to kind of to push us in another direction, which I'll talk about in a moment. So native mind, First Nations, Think of mind in relational activity, a mind in community. There's no mm -hmm. isolation, right? And in these First Nation societies, and in many others, our duties are to foster heart, mind, spirit. They go together. You don't just do the mind alone. And religious leaders of various kinds of major religions around the world have said, you know, mind alone, the intellect alone, oh my God, that's dangerous. 
Don't do that, right? It's okay for uh, temporary, you know, solving a problem to go into linear thinking and cause and effect, but that's not the place to exist on a day-to-day -day basis. We also need to perceive, perceive our interconnection to others. That means other than humans as well as humans, and to dedicate ourselves to connecting and caring in respectful ways with all our relations. So that's mm. mountains, rivers, animals, plants, in every instant and activity. So it's a very humble orientation to living, to not um, put yourself first, but always consider the web of life and the impacts you're having by what you're doing and what you're saying. And it's uh, just to point out a couple books that <clears throat> give us a broader picture. Until the last 400 years or so, a third of the globe was in these non-civilized societies. They lived with many of the characteristics that I'm going to talk about later. And this state he hegemony became dominant really in the 1600s. And that's what we're feeling the effects of, the causal effects of all that coercion all over the world. So we still have these ghost theories that haunt us and they push us to Wetico. Wetico or Wendigo is a concept of, among Native American communities and it refers to a kind of cannibalism and exploitation of living things. Mm -hmm. And they could see this in, the, in many of the Europeans that came to their North America. Well, you probably should mute your, your mm -hmm. microphones. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so we are now caught up in a culture that's all about exploiting things, right? We think it's normal to just, you know, spray raid on the insects that we find or stomp out the ants or, you know, kill the spider. It's all about that exploitation mind instead of the indigenous respect for life that's generally there. And the British Empire really pushed this first planning these theories all over the world, and now we really have them in our education system, in how structures, uh, the government structures work. So it's white supremacy, individualism and anthropocentrism, intellectualism, capitalism, hierarchicalism, and coercion to keep it all going. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of different historical accounts of how we got here. And Marvin Bram, I'm reading now, historian, <clears throat> points to the Sumer civilization who started this off and then it's just accumulated there's just been accretions of all these ideas that have come to the culminated now in what we're experiencing in the united states so the contrasting worldviews then and this is from robert redfield the social anthropologist uh, who noted really you can divide worldviews into two main kinds and the, the one on the left, the purple one, the dominant culture one, this is again from the 1600s and on. This is what, what's been forced on us, really, that only humans have spirit, only humans really matter, humans are the pinnacle, people become restless, they don't feel at home on the earth, it doesn't feel like home, we're going to go to the Mars, right? I mean, oh, how cool is that? You know, or, you know, travel and, and just in the conquistadores, and I have a, I, that's my, part of my heritage, I'm multiracial. Um, they came to the Americas and just sort of destroyed things as they went, you know, and then left it behind. That's just what they wanted to do. So, and we have this, the English brought this conforming landscapes to abstract ideals. You know, everybody has a green lawn because that's what you do. Those kinds of things, instead of honoring the life that comes into your, your garden or something, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Just a different, whole different mindset. And now we hoard things for ourselves, right? We don't share immediately, as I'll show um, nomadic foragers do. And then on the right side, this is the indigenous perspective found all over the world. Even uh, any, almost any pre-civilized society has this kind of notion to some degree where spirit pervades everything we're mutually related with everything and we're the younger siblings we, we just showed up you know relative to mosses who have been here 400 million years and we've only been around six two depending on how you count that and uh in these societies you you feel at home on the earth you have a placeful uh rootedness you fit in with the local landscape and bio community and you share with the local bio community. <clears throat> so 
we can see from the anthropological reports in archaeology and ethology that 99% of our genus history was found in these small band hunter-gatherer societies. These are foragers with few possessions. <clears throat> They're immediate return societies, meaning they don't invest in cultivation or domestication or resource accumulation. They're still in existence around the world, although of course very much under duress, especially now in Brazil. And they have many traditions uh, in the First Nations are still uh, apparent. Each has their, each landscape, each people has their own unique way of understanding where they are <clears throat> and behaving. And Aldo Leopold, the ecologist, wolf killer turned ecologist, uh, notes that the Dust Bowl um, happened in the United States because the, the Western European settlers <coughs> brought about the European way of doing farming, which was completely inappropriate for the prairies. And, but they didn't think about that. They weren't paying attention to where they were. They just brought all that way, that way of looking at um, <coughs> the natural world from their heritage from Europe. There's a lot of good books on this. Um, Frederick Turner <coughs> and Kirkpatrick Sale have written some good things. But anyway, but we see uh, uh, in the First Nation communities, at least in the small band hunter-gatherers, we see they're generous, calm, kind, and cooperative. And this kind of cultural style is they live in companionship and social well-being and they encourage each other to laugh and smile and enjoy life. It's a multiple age social life, so that's much better than when you put kids together in the same age group. What do they have to learn from one another? Mm. Risk taking, right? Com competition. Whereas in a multi-age social life, you're learning from the, el the older people and the younger uh, love that and the, the older love to teach the young. So it's a very different kind of natural pedagogy. There's no central authority here, no formal leaders. Drove the Europeans crazy when they came to the Americas. They wanted to sign treaties and who's the leader? <laughs> no leader. Fluid boundaries, so there's really no strong outgroup bias. The uh, natives of the Americas were very welcoming to the inv invaders from Europe at first until they learned what kind of character they had. And then they, of course, um, <clears throat> had to withdraw and so on. Uh, high autonomy, they have, can do what they want, and high, there's no coercion, even with children. High solidarity, uh, a gift economy within the group, so you give and take, and with nature. And they have small egos, but large selves. And I could say more about this, but I better keep going. Uh, but they enhance, in the blue box there, they enhance a communal moral self that shapes attention, and they really spend a lot of time touching, playing, um, expressing gratitude uh, in the Native American communities, and that keeps you in a moral mood, really, what I say. So what does healthy adulthood look like? Darwin noted this. Uh, Spencer said at first that humans evolved to be selfish. He changed his mind later, but that got Darwin thinking about that and said, no, look at all these things we've inherited through the tree of life, social pleasure, empathy, all our memories work to remember what we promised and how it went and future um, planning, social concern, concern for the opinion of others, and then controlling our own habits. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all those that I've written about this, published about it, these are all diminishing in the United States uh, from the data that we can look at. <clears throat> we could also hide, uh, add higher consciousness uh, ability to self-transcend, nature connection, this bonding that I mentioned in the sense of being part of a common self rather than ego, individual self. So these are the things we see in nomadic foraging peoples and Darwin noted that when he made his voyages and then he thought about his British compatriots and said, hmm, not much there of these. <laughs> he said the, few, the women had more, British women, but not his male compatriots. <clears throat> John Young and his colleagues uh, do work all over the world and work with uh, the um, Kung Bushmen, and they've uh, identified what the thriving person looks like in these societies. So it's a, having a quiet mind, um, lots of creativity, 
and uniqueness and inner happiness, a vitality, lots of uh, energy in the body. Mm. They listen well, they have empathy, they're authentically helpful. They seem very fully alive and aware of the sacredness of life and they demonstrate compassion and forgiveness. So <clears throat> how did we get here where we don't see a lot of those people around us? Well, my work then looks at this cycle of uh, how child raising practices, number one there, affects your, our individual psychosocial neurobiology, how that affects how we are as adults in terms of our wellness, in terms of our <clears throat> morality, what kind of morality, and then how adults create cultures and stories or narratives that continue the cycle. So why is that important, uh, that first one? Why is it important to pay attention to the early caregiving? Well, young children are needy. We are born, compared to other animals, we look like fetuses until we're 18 months old, uh, for various reasons. Uh, and our brain volume at birth is only 25% of adult brain volume. And there's tons of right brain development before age two that's scheduled to occur with good development, with good care. And that has a lot to do with those moral, the moral sense and the higher consciousness that I mentioned and self-control. Immune system takes about six years. So the evolved nest that I'm going to talk about, our developmental system, is really intended to be in pretty intense till around age six. And we are more developmentally plastic epigenetically than our cousins of chimpanzees, for example. So we expect to have a lot of good experience after birth. <clears throat> Here you can see the hominid comparisons, the genus on the left side, we're at the bottom row there. And then across the top, gestational days, brain volume at birth, which I've mentioned, the eruption of the first last permanent teeth, these are indicators of cognitive shifting and the average length of breastfeeding. Look at that, what a shocker. Four years on average, that's the average age of weaning. <clears throat> and then the completion of physical growth, generally 20. Um, but we know the neuroscientists tell us that the brain doesn't reach adult functioning until about age 30. So we have a long way to go, three decades to build a human being. <coughs> So we, babies, need external gestation. We need an external womb because there's a constant interaction between nature and nurture. Every second that baby is building lots of synapses, connecting neurons that they're born with from experience. And so there's tons of epigenetics. We are dynamic systems. So the early uh, experience matters for what the trajectory is for that system. And emotions and cognitions really are intertwined and developed together, along with an implicit self and an implicit social worldview. <clears throat> so it matters how you treat young children. And we have uh, a number of inheritances. And the one that I'm going to talk about in particular is the last one, developmental system for growing the young. Every animal has one of these. Uh, but we also inherit these other things, just to mention them, cooperation and mutualism, which is the nature of nature. Our physiology, we inherit genes, that's usually the focus because they're easy to study, right? They have all these machines to examine them. And so Sir Patrick Bateson <clears throat> and I had a conversation about this and I asked him, why are they talking about genes all the time instead of epigenetics? He says, well, because of all the machinery and the governments have invested in all that. And so that's what you keep hearing about genes for this or that. But look at the picture on the right, that little dot is how many of our genes compete between all our, we, we share 99.9999% of our genes and only a tiny fraction of those SNPs are competing. Uh, <clears throat> single, nucleo, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so we kind of had the wrong focus, I would say. Plus, uh, most of the genes in our bodies are not human. 90 to 90%, 99% of our genes that we carry in each of our bodies is are from the microorganisms that keep us alive so when you talk about genes competing between people like well which ones <laughs> you know we also inherit body plans cell design these are not genetically transmitted an ecology from <clears throat> previous generations mm -hmm. and the culture so 
Let's go to that developmental system. Notice then that species typical developmental mm -hmm. system is going to lead to a species typical outcome. So when you support, provide the support that that species expects, you're going to end up with a smart, effective creature. And so we have a nest. We call it nest, evolved nest for short, evolved developmental niche in the academic publications. Uh, and so let's look at that and why it's important. This is why it's important because our heritage is to develop cooperative companionship, which is what I noted in the First Nations small band hunter-gatherer communities. <clears throat> they provide the nest of companionship, number one. They develop a good physio-neuro-social biology, number two there, and number three, their adults are healthy and wise. And then four, they develop a community that tends to basic needs, especially of the young children. Um, and I'm gonna talk about <clears throat> So how is it that healthy societies develop their young? What is our indigenous heritage? All of us, all our ancestors experience these things. So nested childhood, so we have an evolved nest, we call it for short. And these are the characteristics that we've identified and we study. <coughs> First is soothing perinatal experiences. So that means a calm, welcoming environment during gestation and birth and post-birth. So following the natural rhythms of the mother and body, baby, sorry, and no interference with timing, drugs, no separation of mom and baby, no painful procedures. Unfortunately, the common practices in the US that it exports to, every, to other places uh, are disrupting, disrupting baby development. So they do interfere with timing. They do provide drugs. They do separate mom and baby and they have various painful procedures. So we know that that's not good. There's all sorts of neuroscience now showing those effects on the baby's brain development and they, they can undermine the baby, mother, infant entrainment, the bonding that is ready to happen right after a naturalistic birth, that first hour, the, the uh, physiologies are ready to look at each other, feel each other, know each other in, as basic reward systems. So, um, <clears throat> It's ready to be kind of linked up and bonded uh, and affects uh, breastfeeding and emotional and social development. Second one is breastfeeding on request. So baby will indicate when they need it and a young baby has a very tiny stomach size of a quarter uh, full term birth and they need to have it frequently because our milk is very thin compared to other animals milk, uh, predator milk anyway. So it's on request breastfeeding, as I mentioned. Four years is the average age of weaning. So the, what the anthropologists have shown us is two to five years is the range they see. At least two years, two and a half years, according to James Prescott, who has studied peaceable societies. Two and a half years of breastfeeding and lots of carrying in arms of the children, the young children, and that explains 80% of the variance for peace, peaceful societies. So what does breast milk offer? Well, it, uh, it's linked to higher IQ. Now, most of the studies are done with three months, comparing three months of breast milk and three months of formula. It's like, come well, on, you, you know, there's a lot more going on after a few years, but you know, it's hard to find people who are gonna give their kids formula for four years and breast milk for four years in the United States. So. Anyway, these are the good things that happen. It uh, <clears throat> alleviates pain, analgesic. Uh, there's all sorts of sugars that uh, it has to feed the bacteria in the breast milk uh, and it's antimicrobial, anti linked to greater grain, si grain size, et cetera. So you can see there's lots of things that we know from just a little bit of breast milk that are good. And we have positive moving touch. And this means no negative touch. So kids expect to be moving because we evolved, you know, wandering around the world, nomadic foragers, right? So their baby's expecting to be walking around in arms and we need this to grow well. <clears throat> and separating mommy, uh, a mammal baby from the mother dysregulates multiple systems. There's been all sorts of animal studies to show this causing lifelong changes in stress responsivity, impulsive violence, depressive disorders, that kind of thing. But we do it routinely now, right? These things that I'm talking about, the US doesn't pay attention. Other countries are paying more attention to these early effects 
and they're changing. They offer parental leave, for example, for at least a year, and the U.S. doesn't do that because they know that it matters for bonding and for breastfeeding and for holding and touching. So there's long-lasting health benefits for positive touch, prevents excessive stress or hippocampal dis dysfunction, uh, and promotes all sorts of good things like sleep cycles and uh, cognitive functioning. And actually, touch is good for all ages, so <laughs> yes. And if your oxytocin system has been set up well in early life, uh, then you will uh, have that kick in when you get a hug for, uh, for, from someone you uh, like, um, things like that. Even holding hands, even the, in the small band hunter-gatherers, some of them hold hands when they're walking through the jungle, or they sit next to each other shoulder to shoulder in the savanna, even though there's plenty of room, right? And then corporal punishment, we know a lot more about this now that it uh, leads to greater aggression. So increased negative outcomes for kids and that means spanking, hitting, pinching. And spanking is actually empirically similar to physical and emotional abuse. And we have all sorts of convergent evidence now. Next one's positive climate. Positive social climate means that you're going to experience more positive than negative emotions. That means more joy and serenity, expansiveness, less sadness, anger, fear, humiliation. And in our studies, we find that adults who report their childhoods having more of these positive emotions are more secure in attachment, mentally healthier, less distressed, and less likely to be more self-protective, which I'll talk about later. And this means to feel loved and cherished, like you belong, like you're appreciated, uh, and you have create positive action, reactions with others. So oh, it's good for all ages too. And we have self-directed social play. This uh, facilitates emotion regulation, gene expression, like 1200 different genes are expressed um, through play, mm -hmm. fosters brain development, and it's also good for all ages, and I'll mention it again later. Yeah, well, here, right hemisphere development is happening in the present moment. So if you were undercared for as a child, you can build your right hemisphere again with play. <clears throat> Anything that keeps you in the present moment will then increase your uh, in social, you know, play, dance, um, art, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, make you more flexible then, more attuned, more open, more sensorily open. And the right hemisphere is related to, um, is designed to build all these things in the first few years of life, self-regulation, emotional intelligence, and empathy, these kinds of things that we see deficits of in many adults in the States. Hello mothers, so these are other nurturers. We evolved to raise children in the community of Allo mothers. That's the way we are as a species. And mothers actually need to feel supported in order to really be responsive to their children. And it's been linked to various um, outcomes in kids in our, in our empirical studies here. And the competence of children and their social skills are related to mothers' perceived social support. And we all, of course, need supportive mentors throughout life. So this is not just for babies. Responsive relationships. These are those that um, are reciprocal, that uh, demonstrate a synchrony uh, between the two people and then repair the dyssynchrony when that occurs. Babies learn to do that with good care. Uh, mutually influencing one another is related to uh, moral development in children, greater conscience and empathy and cooperativeness when there's a mutually responsive relationship with the caregiver, the primary caregiver. Limbic resonance is happening. <clears throat> it's like an external umbilical cord and building shared narratives, shared stories, shared patterns of behavior. All these things establish brain wiring, <clears throat> emotion regulation, and habitual patterns of getting along with others. Good for all ages do. Just a, a digression here or a foray into our data. Just a quick couple things here. We've um, got a published paper examining <clears throat> mother's reports of how much of the evolved nest they provided in the past week. 
and we ask them these six questions, a few other questions too, but these six uh, seem to carry the, the workload uh, about positive touch. How much, how often did you affectionately touch or hug the child? How often did you spank them? How much did they play outside freely and inside freely? So this is not organized sports or anything. This is free play. And then family togetherness. How much did you do things together at home or outside the home? And then we find <clears throat> multiple um, outcomes here. I'll just show you one from the USA. Um, on the left side are, on the top are all the control variables. And the bottom one is the evolved nest in the last week. Evolved developmental niche provision report. On the right side, um, that the variables that comprise the latent variable of sociality or social thriving. You can see a social attunement. How much does your child <clears throat> tune into being with others when they're face to face? How much do they enjoy it? How considerate are they? How imaginative are they? Are they thriving? Is your child happy? And these things um, then are predicted by the nest. We've also got adults. We've asked similar questions of adults. How much in childhood were you affectionately touched? How much were you spanked? How much did you play outside freely, inside freely? How much were you together with family, inside the home, outside the home? <coughs> and we can um, find several path models. So evolved nest history, how much of that did you have in childhood, is uh, related to um, secure attachment, which then leads to better mental health, so less anxiety and depression, better interpersonal capacities, perspective taking in particular, and then a more relational attunement in how you treat other people. And then there were two negative pathways, so less evolved nest history, lower secure attachment, worse mental health, um, <clears throat> worse perspective taking, or worse personal distress. And then the ethical orientation was of self-protectionism. <clears throat> so withdrawal or oppositional, oppositionalism when you're with others. <clears throat> All right, so back to the evolved nest, nature connection. Uh, here, it's a matter of developing caring relationships with the natural world and doing, um, having a sense of belonging to the earth. Uh, and in our lab, well, it's good for all ages too. <clears throat> uh, oh, and these are the kinds of things that really help with nature connection, walking outside, some of the gardening, all these kinds of things and building uh, ecological attachment with particular practices. And we did that an experiment on this three-week intervention with college students that worked. <clears throat> so each day they were to do one of uh, a set of um, activities and then practice it all day. And then three weeks later, they came for the post-test and we found an increase in their ecological attachment. <clears throat> so ecological attachment and earth-based wisdom then are really part of our heritage. And it's Aldo Leopold has this good um, statement about that. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And I think this is part of our deep indigenous wisdom. And then finally, healing practices. These are things that we do routinely to heal recent and old wounds. So in our ancestral context, many rituals, conflict resolution, play, playful acting we can do with our kids, uh, play out those things that make them worried, for example. And these are things that are good for all ages too. <clears throat> so when we look at daily practices, what is it that uh, is needed? So first let me um, say that I'll present this again. These, these are three kind of systems that evolved in our brain. Uh, that were identified by Paul McLean. We were born with these survival systems, these emotion systems of anger, fear, panic, lust, and seeking. And then we have to develop the other two, the mammalian, the social and play emotion systems are, are shaped by experience and so are the executive functions. So when we <clears throat> uh, want to, and I haven't talked about the, how they go wrong, but anyway, here I am talking about how to fix them, is we want to uh, provide regular um, routines of self-calming and then lots of social joy experiences, as well as a communal imagination, the stories we tell about ourselves and about each other. Um, and I'll go on now. So what are the effects of unnestedness? <clears throat> what happens when you move from early experiences that look like this 
see all the caring and all the touching and all the responsiveness and the happy children and the contented children. Two experiences of early life like this. A lot of isolation, physical isolation, leaving babies to cry, not really paying attention to them, feeding them bottled formula, that kind of thing. Well, you're gonna have a, that's a species atypical developmental system and you're gonna have a species atypical outcome. So if you don't provide the support expected, you're gonna have a, a creature that's outside the range of intelligence and effectiveness. And this is pretty much what we've done in the United States, especially if we don't provide for family well-being in many, many ways. <clears throat> and then what happens then, physiology gets malformed. So we can see that, I don't have all the references here, but there's tons of references now and stress response gets kind of messed up and you get threat reactive, you get stress reactive. That means that blood flow shifts away from the higher order thinking and then mobilizes you for fight or flight, right? And then you just get, you spend a lot of time in that mode if you're really been traumatized as a child. <clears throat> the immune system isn't developed properly. The endocrine system, oxytocin system doesn't work well. Mm. You see that in the orphans from Romania. Neurotransmitters, the number and the function of them don't work so well. Emotion, emotion systems, corpus callosum is thinner, especially in boys who have less built-in resilience. And that means the brains don't communicate well and you flip into states. Um, so uh, the picture there is from Bruce Perry and it shows a normal three-year-old brain on the left, a slice, and then on the right, one with extreme neglect. So you just don't grow very well. And uh, these things can happen from trauma, abuse, neglect, and what I call undercare, which is the lack of a nest. <clears throat> you can see, I like this picture because on the left, you see a normal brain with lots of synapses, a lot of connections that neuron has to other neurons. And on the right, you see a neuron with fewer connections. That's what happens when you leave babies to cry, it kind of melts those synapses uh, and um, leave babies alone. You know, depression is what the, the, the left side um, looks like in the brain. So my interest in ethics and morality is then pushing me to say, that we need to provide for baby needs. They involve nest, that's the ethical approach. And when we deny babies what they need to grow well, because then you end, they end up with these problems, right? Physiologically, emotionally, et cetera, that's really unethical. So brain system with good care then has the control, the executive functions grow well and they're able to control the survival systems. So if all of a sudden, <clears throat> a shadow comes across your room, you get scared, right? Panic, oh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, the, the sun just went behind a cloud, rather than, oh, it's a bear, ah! Uh, so you're able to control that fear, that uh, upset that you have to get back to homeostasis when the brain works well. When it doesn't, you go on and on, you can't calm down, you keep uh, having that reverberate. And then <clears throat> you spend most of the time in these systems that are grown after birth. So when you're loved and cared for and in the community that I mentioned, you're gonna develop a high caring, high playfulness, and your executive functions keep you in this heart-centered imagination. <clears throat> when things don't go well in early life, you're gonna have a toxic stress then that leads to a disposition for self-protection. And when those, the stress response kicks in, as I mentioned, it controls executive function. It takes over your brain. You see red, and this is what, uh, what Paul McLean was pointing out, these different global brain states. And in early life, you don't grow the sociality, um, emotions very well, the skills. There's multiple layers of, sub, of uh, subconscious skills that must be grown from experience of being in arms all the time that don't grow. <clears throat> And so you end up here, um, in each situation, we, we face it with, a, read it quickly, see whether we feel safe or unsafe. And when we feel safe, that left side will engage and attune and, and be more relaxed. But when we feel unsafe, you see that from the bottom up, this is the bottom up uh, reading of cues, very quickly, milliseconds. If we feel unsafe, then we're going to be in that safety defensive mode, we'll brace ourselves against others, we'll brace ourselves against that situation. And so a poorly designed brain will spend a lot of time over on the right side, 
always feeling unsafe and then having to do something to feel safe, like adopt an ideology that, you know, makes you superior to everyone else, for example. Um, and then at the top, you see executive functions. So our, we can move into safety and unsafety by the stories we tell ourselves. So if you've been told that green people are dangerous and you see a green person, you're going to go on the right side, even though you've never had the experience, but you've been told that over and over and over. Uh, and so we have to be careful then with our stories and what we tell children, but as well as how we treat them. So these are the kinds of um, self-protectionist modes that we uh, look at in my lab. The immediate face-to-face -face social opposition there, uh, the or social withdrawal, because you don't feel safe. That person mm -hmm. reminds you of your abusive uncle. You just don't be yourself in that moment. And then on the right side are how we use our imagination, our abstract capacities in relation to those similar kinds of instincts or impulses. So when we want to, we feel social opposition, angry um, and contrary, then we can use our imagination for vicious, what we call vicious imagination, wanting to control others or, you know, or uh, take revenge. But the one at the bottom on the right, detached imagination, this is what we teach all our kids, all the successful people in the States to become emotionally detached, to go to school, don't feel anything, don't think about the bird outside the window, just take the test, right? So we push kids into this detached imagination where you have no sense, you learn just to you know, think logically on paper, and then you have no sense of how you're thoughts and actions impact the world and your relationships and your responsibilities. There's no sense of that. And that's where the West has really moved. So what we've done now is we've created a cycle of undercare, developing, developmentally inappropriate early child raising. And then we have poor uh, development of biopsychosocial neurobiology. We have lots of adults with ill being, illness, and limited social moral capacities. They don't think very well. And then degraded culture where adults are distracted, overwhelmed, or over-controlling. And so they continue the cycle and keep, we keep going, mm -hmm. spiraling in the wrong direction at the moment. Maybe we're waking up, we'll see. So again, uh, we need to attend to our stories. We, we tend to <clears throat> um, all our institutions and stories that we hear in the, in the media tend to support this sacred money and market story, you know, free markets and, you know, the well-being of money is more, of more concern right now to, seems to the Republican Party of today than the well-being of people uh, and because they don't want to give money to people who lost their jobs in the pandemic, and et cetera. They, but they gave about two and a half trillion to the billionaires and corporations earlier. Anyway, so that just to me sounds like they're sacred money, not sacred life and living earth, which would be the indigenous perspective. <clears throat> So we can intervene at any point here. We can make sure that intergenerationally we provide for basic needs of the young and of all ages. We actually all need the nest throughout life, but I was focused on the early life um, version. And <clears throat> we can support balance and support healing in the adults who need it, and then make sure our narratives and, and, narratives and institutions emphasize connection and be meeting basic needs. And <clears throat> all this, <clears throat> with the planet, with the earth in mind. We can re-nest ourselves for healing with all the other um, practices of the nest other than birth, unless you do have birth therapy, I guess. And then breast milk, we probably don't. But although, you know, the fats in breast milk are linked to not getting Alzheimer's. So, <laughs> and there was a British uh, ice cream shop that made their ice cream from breast milk some years ago, so. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, I left those two off. But the rest of us can you know, do all these other things to heal our, our um, maybe neglected selves, undercared for ourselves. So in summary, <clears throat> we are shaped by and supported by the evolved nest. Our socio-moral development is rooted in our neurobiology and goes all the way up uh, from the biological to the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. And community narr narratives and support are really vital for an ongoing healthy behavior. These are books, lots of books. Indigenous Sustainable Wisdom is a recent one. And then more information. Feel free to contact me. Thanks.
Mm, I don't okay, hear. do you want to uh, bring us, uh, <laughs> you can stop sharing your screen. We'll bring us back to the discussion oh. frame. Um, excellent. So uh, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to, let's open it up and see where uh, people may want to take this conversation or follow up on. Um, who's got a question for Darsha? Storm clouds are moving in here. It's mm -hmm. getting dark. <laughs> okay. Uh, Waldemar, I saw. Hmm. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Waldemar. I'm curious about your work. Have you been able to see anything in the way of the neurobiological changes if the evolved nest um, is successful in transmitting ethical principles to the child or, or to the adult? Uh, well, we, we look at it uh, from a neurobiological uh, stance. So we can see that kids who are, have more of the nest, depending on which, here comes the storm. <laughs> um, the, uh, my apologies, the wind is really picking up. Uh, so we, we can see that there is um, neurobiological effect. And so we link the ethics and morality to that. So when you get panicked, you're not going to be open hearted, right? You're not going to be open minded. You're going to try to find a safe way to be. Um, and so we can see in our kids that we're doing a longitudinal study, and we have uh, up to six years old data now, um, <clears throat> that they're, um, we're just working on the papers now, uh, their physiology of their vagus nerve uh, functions better when their mother has been responsive. So if your vagus nerve functions well, you're gonna be more able to be intimate with others, to be open to them. If it doesn't function well, you're gonna to tend to have more you know, avoidant attachment or some kind of insecure attachment, which makes you less flexible and attuned to others. So we look at it sort of that, at that level, and then we, we can map it on for adults. Uh, they're, they tend to be more self-protective when they didn't have the good biological beginning. So I don't think I'm ask, answering your question, but we kind of look at it that way and not, not as an intellectual ethics kind of idea thing. It's more, it comes, bubbles up from the, that um, experience, the way your body's working. So people who are diabetic and their, their sugar is dropping, they tend to be less forgiving, for example, right? And so uh, it makes perfect sense that your biology is gonna mess you up. Now, there are exceptions, right? Um, and there are other people who, Anyway, but I, I'll stop. Maybe you okay. want to follow up or whatever Greg thinks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, then we'll go to Cole and then Joe and then Tara. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for this presentation. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you're familiar with like parent-child interaction therapy and maybe like behavioral parent training. Uh, these are some, uh, you know, like, clinical psychology, like behavioral based treatments that, uh, that I work with. Um, and I'm wondering if you think those are sort of in line with some of the principles that you've laid forth, or if they're kind of more grounded in too much of like a Western ideology that focuses on like maybe shoving things into short time frames to like maximize effectiveness outcomes, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with those two uh, approaches. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can just speak about them for a second. Um, as I work with the behavioral parent training and the parent-child interaction therapy, I've been trained in some as well. Um, just for a little bit of context, like basically parent-child interaction therapy takes kids with behavioral um, issues, externalizing, internalizing problems, and then gives them like a 16-week treatment where essentially they try to uh, capture all of the negative interactions with the parent um, and then by like having a therapist through a one-way window like talking in the parent's ear literally like with a device in the parent's ear they try to coach the parent to like provide the child with more like 
praise, for example, and attention through like reflecting the child's behavior and these kind of things. Um, and then like kind of systematically get rid of any like negative touch, um, things like that. Uh, so essentially like that is the first half of the treatment. And then the other half focuses on discipline where uh, the parent learns how to initiate a timeout sequence where, you know, it's, it's very grounded in like uh, cognitive behavioral principles. Um, so I don't know, but I mean, basically, it's, like I said, it's a 16 week treatment. It's very popular in uh, mainstream child clinical psychology. Um, and I guess I was just wondering if like something like that, you know, uh, through sort of your lens of your work and your perception of like child rearing practices is if you view that like um, to be sort of like coterminous with what you're suggesting or sort of in line with uh, what you're proposing or sort of maybe too much grounded in a modern uh, Western like empirical ideology. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a few mm -hmm. comments. Um, in my view, the, uh, in the States, I guess I should stick to that, uh, we tend to intervene late, right? So these are issues the parent and child develop early on, right? But now it's getting too out of hand, so let's come in and try to fix things. So uh, resilience is talked about a lot. For me, uh, resilience means you get back to zero, right? It's like functioning adequately. You're not going to drop out of high school. You're not going to get pregnant. You're not going to become delinquent. That's like the base, the, just the minimum, right, of being a good person. Uh, my work emphasizes optimizations, like 100, 0 to 100. Let's see what that, you, that child's uniqueness is. What are their gifts to help them flourish and to provide to the community their unique perspectives and their, uh, you know, understandings of living? So, so it doesn't really meet my criteria for optimization. And optimization has to come in every day from the beginning of the life of that child. And even before prior generations, we know that uh, grandparents who went through <clears throat> a lot of stress, such as a famine, affect you as a grandkid, uh, can affect you and, and create a survival phenotype. Right, so you're ready for fight when you come out uh, the womb, and and then uh, fight for food. Uh, they usually look at that kind of thing, and your body is set up for that. But then the food is everywhere, and so you eat, and then you get you get obese uh, and all these health problems because you were set up for a different environment from generations before. And so for me, it's an intergenerational thing. We've we've been on this cycle of of um, <clears throat> undercaring for kids and traumatizing them in so many ways. And so it's gonna take some generations to move back. Meanwhile, these kinds of interventions are helpful, right? Because we have to do something. We want them to be at least uh, reliable members of the society. Maybe they will never develop their full gifts. Or maybe there'll be some, you know, we're very interesting creatures. We can have these instant healing moments. And so maybe there's gonna be an opportunity later for them. But I, I am very much about optimizing every moment of that child's life as much as possible, uh, and which sounds extreme, I'm sure, to people. But. Uh, Joe, then Tara. Hi, thanks. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Great. Um, uh, first of all, thank you. This is a great presentation. Certainly explains a lot about my own life. But anyway, uh, <laughs> more to the point. Uh, so I want to use an analogy first and then get your, your insights and maybe others in this group, because I'm a non-psychologist, as many already know. Um, so the, the metaphorical example I use is learning language, our first language, okay? So my wife is Iranian. So if you ask me now to speak or think in Persian, I have a very difficult time doing that, right? So I'm going to naturally, and it's hardwired neurologically, right, in my brain and so forth, to think in English and so forth. Actually, Spanish is my second language. Uh, but it's very difficult for me to speak uh, Farsi or speak it well, right? Okay, so, um, and it's hard for me to develop those connections now, right? The reason we have accents, of course, is because we lose the capacity to make the sounds that, you, you know, when you're little and you're, you're so plastic and you can, you know, you can speak Mandarin, right? You can't, it's hard to speak it much later. So the, 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 you, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about the, the deficits that one experiences neurologically, right? Uh, 
with the lack of touch and appropriate caregiving, et cetera, et cetera. It's exactly what I found, by the way, in my own work with violent uh, offenders. Okay, but I look at their toxic family environments, and lo and behold, it's not new news. Those who experience high levels of toxicity, toxicity, meaning in terms of lack of parental supports and uh, you know a variety of other kind of sociological factors. That's the stuff I look at. Sure enough, um, compared to control group of uh, university students, uh, the, the violent offenders experience far more of these adverse events and toxic environments. Okay. So my question then is, bring it back to your presentation and for this group is, okay, um, given that we learn this stuff and like language from birth, right? We're exposed to these things. What are the long-term, not just what are the long-term consequences, how does one then contravene those negative effects if this is so ingrained in us, like the equivalence, the metaphorical equivalence of language? So in other words, how does one then regain and recover this? And again, I appreciate we have psychologists and people who do all sorts of different kinds of therapies and, and even in, you know, other things that, that I've looked at myself or tried, emotional tapping and so on and so forth. My point is, how do you regain and, 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 and redevelop neurologically these capacities that have been denied you when you're young? And in other words, so how do you develop the language skills, if you will, the emotional language skills that you didn't have when you were little, much like as if you're trying to develop new language skills in, you know, Farsi or whatever, when you're an adult. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, and it's a tough question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, we, we have some plasticity. Now, as yep. you note, know, we don't have plasticity on learning a good accent. It takes a lot of work for an adult to learn right. a good accent, right? So it's I'm a, a lot- good monkey that way though. That I do well, I can imitate. <laughs> 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 right. So uh, similarly, I think we can learn to revamp our brains and our uh, way of reacting. So when I, um, in my classes, I use various techniques, mm -hmm. as I mentioned too early in the talk, I realized uh, you have to learn to self calm and to pay attention to when you're getting upset, because that's changing everything and your chemistry is going to change how you act, right? So you have to pay attention when your jaw is getting tight or you're starting to ruminate and then have practices to move away from that. So think of gratitude is, is a good one. It shifts your mindset. Uh, go put your hands in the garden. I mean, that's shown to, you know, and increase the amount of time you're doing that or take a walk or all sorts of things that different uh, people recommend. And then, but for us with avoidant attachment, uh, professors tend to have that because we were rewarded for cognition and not for our emotions and our emotions are underdeveloped and so it's a little hard to get along with others right so you have to then put yourself in situations where you you learn that again you get joy out of being with others rather than joy being in alone reading and writing and stuff uh, and what I do in my classes we play folk song games and that makes the, you're playing things like farmer in the dell we don't do that one but better ones than that uh, and then you have to be there with each other and you're looking at each other, you're touching each other and you're running around and uh, <clears throat> you're here and you're growing a brain right then. So you have to have those kinds of uh, experiences where you really are here in the moment and you have to be to play the game, right? So you can't just pretend and go sit in the, under the tree and try to be present. But, uh, and then the communal imagination is the other one that uh, I think we've narrowed our a kind of a moral shrinkage about what we think is moral and what's good and we have to expand it again so you read and you listen to people who have these expanded ideas and then you you know start your mind starts to change you hear it a few times um <clears throat> so i don't know if that helps but thanks for the question tara can you hear me yes First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I had a smile throughout. I was like, oh. <laughs> I felt so energized by and inspired um, by what you spoke about. And as someone who's very connected to my own, you know, indigenous wisdom and traditions, and I'm constantly thinking about how to, you know, how to bring that back. Um, so it's very inspiring to see um, work like yours. Uh, I wanted to ask you about whether there is work on an evolved nest approach to schooling um, and or if there are resources that you can point me to because I would love to get into that also a little bit. Well, that used to be the way we raised children, right? They, before industrialization, children learn from being at home and learning their, their parents' uh, 
trades and talents. Uh, so it's just recently we've decided to put them all in the same room, the same age, <laughs> separated uh, for factory work, really, preparing factory workers. Uh, that's how it evolved. But um, yeah, so there are moves to homeschool, of course. You know, there's also unschooling, uh, which is where you follow the interests of the child. Now, that one would take a parent or a family um, setting where you have time and money to do things. Uh, but I'm thinking this time now, uh, we're starting to see pods, educational pods that parents are putting together in the time of COVID here. And so that might, maybe we'll be transforming things now. Another one that uh, comes to mind is forest kindergartens, which have been around in uh, Scandinavian countries for maybe 15 years or more, where the kids just spend the whole day outside. And there's a video, I could send the link if uh, I'll find it. Uh, where uh, the the person covering, uh, giving a little documentary about it <clears throat> in Denmark, I think, uh, there's a child that's way up there, it's like 100 feet up in a tree. And, and so we're all watching this child go swaying with a tree. And the, <laughs> and the interviewer says, uh, do you have any accidents? Don't you worry about kids getting hurt? And the director said, well, in our 17 years, uh, the only time we had to take anybody to the hospital was when a parent drove over the foot of a child. <laughs> so when you le let children find their way in the world, they're very smart, like other animals. You don't see all these animals falling off a cliff, right? I mean, they, they, if you let them learn, they will learn how to, to get along well. And so I would, if I were to have an evolved nest school, I would have it outside as much as possible with a lot of wild experience. Um, babies too, leave them outside so they can learn to uh, perceive our sensory perceptions are so minimal now. When you raise kids inside walls, oh, and uh, we, we emphasize vision as the thing, right? Oh, there's like 33 senses and we're missing them when we don't provide kids with a real full fullness of our nest. Thank you. Uh, Mike, then Lee. Thank you for the talk. Uh very stimulating, a very, um, very warm feeling, <laughs> very warm feeling, um, which, you know, if we juxtapose against our current culture, uh, we don't feel very warm. Um, uh, what you're talking about um, strikes me as, you know, obviously, as, as so much more than beyond the parenting or beyond education and that sort of thing. I mean, you're talking about the, 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 um, the fundamental core structures of our value systems and their way of organizing our economic life. And, uh, you know, when I think about that, uh, it just seems so daunting. Uh, you know, it just seems so daunting. Um, the, the only hope that I have when I think about at, at that level is I actually think about, um, and my question to you is going to be the obvious, you know, what are you going to do about how we do, how do we change society to make this happen? <laughs> so um, it's something small, tiny, tiny question. Uh, in S Scotland, I was absolutely uh, uh, amazed to find that built that they have. A, I, I'm going to get the words wrong, but they have a, a national mission statement. And in this national mission statement, they actually include such things as care and compassion for people. I gave. I heard a woman give a talk. She was a a, a public planner, and what they do in Scotland is apparently is that they go to, to the places where they're planning. And they don't ask people for solutions. They ask people for problems. What problems do you have? And then uh, uh, they, um, they, they, they come up with possible solutions. They bring them back. These work over and over that there's a constant uh, 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 d desire here uh, to, to get at what's important to people in their real, in their, in their lives. Um, that's the type of transformation that we need at the top. How the heck do you get there when what you're, what you're looking for is a spiritual, spiritual, cultural, ecological transformation? Um, so save us. How would you do that? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I think we have to each start in the corner we're in. So to uh, support families and children where we are as much as possible to, uh, try to simplify our lives perhaps away from the 
at least destructive uh, um, actions that we could take to be more aware, to read and, and then talk and support um, the more progressive, I guess, ideas. Um, and restorative justice, I think, is part of that. We have a massive problem with the way we treat people in police, policing and prisons. Um, but there is some movement towards restorative justice. Now, in, in the Native American communities, that means you have a circle of people who go around and just they check in first. How are you uh, today? Uh, you know, and then they, they each kind of they have this um, issue. For example, a, a uh, in one case, Rupert Ross writes about this in his books, uh, uh, where a child broke a window, uh, adolescent, broke a window and stole a, bot a bottle of whiskey. And um, instead of this guy, Rupert Ross is an attorney, <clears throat> and he, he visited uh, hundreds of uh, Native communities in Canada. And they told him this is not working to take the kids away and put them in prison. They come back, they don't know anything, they didn't solve anything. So they, he tried this circle approach with them. And so that you bring people to the circle and everyone says how they're uh, affected and the tornado sirens going off. Um, and they uh, say how they're affected and uh, they each kind of do it. There's no uh, force, there's no um, plan. And in that, it takes a while, right? But it's the right hemisphere working. It's this process of being and mending disconnection. So I think everything we do can be about mending disconnection. So we have to learn how to not react to the people who have a political view that makes us mad or do things, right? We have to yeah. learn to be calm ourselves and to be welcoming and to understand that they are feeling pain and to be, have empathy. So all these practices i mean it's complicated <laughs> but we can all do our little bit in your own sphere yeah yeah uh, there's a book called um, the geranium on the shelf just died but the teacher just went on teaching Talking. yeah yeah um i i can't help but say that there's a tornado warning going on but do <laughs> <I know. laughs> you need to you need to do something darsha obviously we should we can well, i can just walk down the stairs with a computer Okay. Well, we're certainly, we're already at 643. We can uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> well, first things first, it's tornado. <laughs> that's, that, that, right? that uh, my understanding important. of safety and the hierarchy of me <laughs> is, is like, uh, right. all right. Well, we appreciate the dedication to the TOK community. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm going to tell my husband he's in the shower. Okay. Yeah. We're certainly not without our disasters after your computer crashes and we're in the right I know. Uh, a little bumpy uh right that was actually it was my fault i moved my computer without checking the wire in the back and yanked it right out of there you know uh quickly though to, to mike's point mm -hmm. right about how we can shift the discourse and so mm -hmm. forth it, it always amazes me that we focus in the national discourses, especially in the States. Now, of course, I'm in Canada, but largely to the similar degree here on economic indicators mm -hmm. as the measures of our well-being. It's always, again, perplexed me why we don't have as part of our regular conversation, as part of our national dialogue, basic discussions, just as prominently uh, displayed as economics, about health indicators and social well-being. Why, you know, in other words, why not shift the conversations and the things that we talk about, not just from the unemployment figures, which are obviously critically important, but right. certainly right. away from merely GDP or GDP per capita, right, yep. to, to any number of other measures of health and social well-being. That, to me, from the political standpoint, would be well, where in Bhutan. In Bhutan, you've got the, what is it, the Gross National gross Happiness National Scale. Happiness scale yeah. right. That's exactly, uh, that's part of the whole transition of our values. Uh, and what has, you know, been a value of material control and dominance and acquisition and consumption and growth um, that fundamentally, I believe, part of the transition in this time between worlds is to recognize that that course um, needs to transition to a different course of fulfillment. And the reason I like Darsha's stuff so much in part is because it creates the picture 
of weaving together our relationships, our ecology, uh, a return to wholeness through and through, uh, and provides us both, you know, logical arguments, evidence, a developmental perspective, and a trajectory of the kinds of values um, that would hold us, and then we can reciprocate with in a way that is much more, well, wholesome and fulfilling, so. Um, can I just jump in with one more quick comment then? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I actually, I didn't know Mike's work, but I used his approach in just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody in the States uh, uh, a year and a half ago or so, who was an ardent Trump supporter, but we were talking about the healthcare systems. Okay, okay so very quickly, by the end of the conversation, We'd, we had connected on our common experiences. So you talk about empathy and the importance, but our common experiences of, of health issues and how we dealt with them. And he was completely on board by the end of the conversation with mm -hmm. this Canadian talking about universal health care. And, and by the end of the conversation, he said, wow, I could really go for that mm -hmm. <laughs> because of his own needs, his own struggles. Right. So we found, we emphasized not the adversarial aspects of not, oh, he's a Trump supporter and I'm a Canadian, so what do I know, you know? But we focused on that common ground and common experience mm -hmm. and what would take us back, you know, to an area of shared sort of understanding and, and as I say, empathy and so forth. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it's possible, but that's at a, you know, that's at a one-on-one -on -one level as opposed to these broader, yeah, you know, no, and with the social media environment, it's really, really tough. We have to do, I think, uh, Darsha's point about a little corner. I know Lee had a question. We can go to that. Yeah, um, I hope you're safe. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to start with, uh, which we won't get to. But the first one is, can you compare positive outcomes as you've described them for what I'll call parenting at home as opposed to preschool programs? Well, it depends on the home. So uh, ideally, you would have uh, kind of a, uh, a home where the child gets to play outside a lot. We don't have that much anymore in the States. Uh, and that where you have a extended community uh, experience ongoing. And uh, so you have nest components. Now, if you don't have that at home, and the child's just sitting there in a carrier or a playpen or a crib, which too many kids are, then preschool's better. Preschool gives them the community, at least some kind of community, it gives them stimulation, right? So it depends. I think, it, so you can't make a blanket statement that preschool's for everybody, uh, but we've kind of uh, pulled the rug out of ch early childhood in the States, and so it's almost like it is better for everybody rather than sitting in front of the TV or something. Um, an idea that might be helpful. Um, could you or have you provided a questionnaire that a parent could use to assess a preschool program? Shall I send them to A or shall I send them to B based on your criteria? Yep, I think. Uh, Might have lost her. Uh, there Sorry, she is. It fell out. Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Say it again, Leland. I'm asking, uh, just as a practical matter, have you or could you provide a simple questionnaire that a that a parent could use in choosing a preschool, so that they would choose the one that's more aligned with the ideas that you've talked about here? Hmm. Right. We actually, a student and I, published a chapter comparing programs uh, in general, but we compared the major ones. Um, uh, Montessori and I forget what the common practices recommended by the three school association what they call it and some others and so we did make recommendations there but we don't really that's a good idea uh, for Evolve Nest I'll, I'll, we'll come up with that kind of thing yeah thanks thanks if you have a draft I'll send it to my daughter we have a nine month old <laughs> <a> year old <laughs> okay <laughs> all right <laughs> Uh, Zach. Well, uh, Darsha, thank you so much. Uh, great, great talk. And one thing, um, so I, I don't mean to be critical, but I was just thinking, oh, um, <laughs> like, um, my, what I'm wondering about is, and I, I would say that maybe one of the few people in this group who who up in an indigenous kind of <laughs> culture where uh, very, it's like a small village uh, in Pakistan where you had an 
uh, it basically was a self-sufficient village where people's livelihood depending, depended on, on the agrarian economy and you know everything was grown nearby. Uh, of course, then the modern stuff happened. But anyway, what I was wondering about is that when you think about those uh, you know, indigenous templates um, where there are schemas that in different tribes, different people in, in, in different parts of the world use those templates to raise families. Um, and there are new, like for example, templates that Mike mentioned, um, there's Bhutan and other countries that there, you can see that there are clusters of countries and cultures where they are, they are practicing modern templates to raise kids and to have happy families. Um, my, my question is, is it because like, you know, like it doesn't seem to me as black and white, you know, indigenous versus modern. Um, there are, I can point out to several things in the indigenous cultures where there are bad templates that it creates horrible family. I mean, in a sense that family environments where people are marginalized, they are, you know, it's like a caste system in India and Pakistan, you know, going back. And so uh, I'm just wondering, is it a matter of, uh, you know, old versus new? Or is it a matter of, you know, some templates that are out there that they're not getting enough play that if, if, if we paid attention and we learned them and applied them in our everyday lives that we could raise better families? Well, I think it's important to make a distinction between civilization and pre-civilization, and then to uh, distinguish small band hunter-gatherers from complex hunter-gatherers, chiefdoms, tribes. Those are different societies. Um, and only small band hunter-gatherers are egalitarian, fiercely so, uh, and tend to be more matrilinear. Um, then you start to get into more settled societies. And when you have a settled society, complex, am I unstable here? You okay? Yeah, we got you. We got you. Hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you have a settled society, you're going to have some people with more than others. So, um, so then you have to look at what their practices are. If it is potlatch and giving things away, that's part of being a good beater. That's better, right? And then you have to look at all of these practices that they do. So I know uh, one time we collected data of English speakers, and then we wondered why the data looked funny. Well, it turned out we had um, a great number of them from India. And in India, there's punishment. There's corporal punishment happens. It's that way in Italy, too, I guess. But, uh, and that shifts the trajectory, right, for uh, where that, how that child's going to be. It makes them so, more self-protective. In various ways. So I think it's, it is more complicated than what I said. Uh, indigenous worldview, though, is what pretty much, um, I mean, it's probably degrees of it. Uh, and same with the nest. Some things we don't know enough about which aspects of the nest are more important than others. Uh, we have increasing amounts of neurobiological studies showing us that they're all important, though. But uh, to miss one and, and have all the rest, uh, you know, like if you didn't get breastfed, probably your health isn't great later, right? Things like that. Um, I had a question, Darsha. Um, you, you obviously emphasize, yeah. can you hear me? Um, you you yeah. obviously emphasize uh, social interconnectedness and socio-emotional regulation, right hemisphere into limbic system, if you want to use those older terms, but basically that co-regulation right from the very beginning. Um, right. One of my models, the influence matrix, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but basically... Uh, I don't remember it. Okay. Yeah. Well, it maps, it basically says the center of it, then I'll give you the center of it and just see what your reaction is. Um, what it suggests is that we are fundamentally tracking the extent to which we're known and valued by important others. Um, and, and so what signals are we getting in relationship to this? So the idea essentially is when we feel nourished, when important others mirror us, they track us with the attention, have shared attention towards uh, our interests and goals, get mirrored reflection along those lines, uh, more the ratio of positive to negative, how we compare in relationship to others. Um, and I guess I'm just curious to uh, get your sense about whether that 
that resonates with you in terms of your fundamental understanding about kind of what is it that people are tracking, their sense of respect, their sense of being known and valued, and then how we cooperate or compete or distance ourselves then stems a lot in relationship to that core central value. Yeah, I think that does align with what I'm saying. I'd probably go further though for infants. It's deeper and broader than that. So mm. I, um, in one of my publications, uh, talk about Maslow's hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And I say that infants, and then I add other things to it besides his, what he pointed out, but I say infants need it all at once. They need it now. They need security. They need esteem. They need love. They need belongingness. They need it all. Mm. If they don't get it, they're not going to develop as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think for infancy, it's just sort of different. It's you need that external womb, which is mm. immediate needs met, just like in the womb, when the baby needs to be eating something, they're fed by the placenta or whatever it is. You know, right. the signals, biochemical signals happens very easily there, and then they get born, and then it's so hard, right? What happened? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it should be easy still for those eight. 18 months. I think so much happens then we hardly understand uh, and we need to study it. Right. Um, the one other thing I'll ask you about it and get your take on and then uh, we can see, I know it's getting close to seven o'clock here is um, there, there have been some concerns uh, raised by people like Jonathan Haidt and the coddling of the American mind. There have been some concerned as um, early to middle to later childhood um, is overprotected. You mentioned this somewhat in terms of allowing children to play and being free and not being overregulated. Um, do you share that view that there's been sort of too much excessive overprotection uh, by parents uh, along those lines, or do you have a different view in relationship? Complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a different view. I think uh, we undercare for babies and infants and young children, and then they get dysregulated and. They don't have confidence and they don't uh, get along well. And then the parents move in as a helicopter, helicopter or mm. snowplow. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so it's an effect of the poor beginnings we have and we don't support families at all, right? Mm. So it's a missing nest in the beginning. And then you've got to move in and parents and realize their kids mm -hmm. are really can't handle things, right? So then they have to Right. Or it can also be these very anxious parents. So the book, uh, Free Range Parenting, was written by Lenore, I'm forgetting last name, Lit, uh, Maisie maybe. Um, and she, it, it all started when her 10-year-old wanted to find his way home in the middle of New York City. He wanted to be dropped off to find his way home out in the suburbs on his own. She mm -hmm. finally agreed when he was 10. Mm. And so she did that, wrote a blog about it. And oh my goodness, the criticism. Right. Uh, because, you know, there's all these laws now where parents can't even let their kids play across the street in the park. Yeah, no. Right? They get, uh, get a, a, a ordinances and stuff. So she, um, she then uh, developed, wrote this book, developed a TV show. I watched one of the episodes where the mother didn't want to let her kids out of the house. And she was finally convinced to let them have a lemonade stand. And so she's watching from the window or they're biting her nails. Right. The kids are having a lemonade stand in suburbia, <laughs> you know, with no trees or anything, just the you know, houses in the street. And right. she's all worried about them. Yeah, so no, we've got anxious good. parents from generations of undercare mm. and all this, the neurobiology. Okay. Right. That. So the, the root of evolved nest and then the overcompensation for that is, is uh, yeah. the narrative I'm hearing. Okay. Any other uh, questions right at seven o'clock here? All right, I think uh, virtually everyone got a chance to share them. Darsha, thank you so much. I really deeply appreciate your uh, knowledge and your wisdom, uh, your connection to the indigenous. Um, I really believe and hope uh, that, you know, kind of the global situation is in a place of transition. I think that's both scary and it's an opportunity. And I think the messages that you bring are exactly the kind of messages we need to consider as we consider the values um, for the 21st century going forward. So well, thank you so much for having me. Good to see you all. Thank you. We really appreciate your participation in the TOK community. All right, take care. All right, bye-bye everyone. I will save this and post it unless there are any objections. Take care. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm.